Hey everyone, it's Wingspan TT, and if you're watching, you know what time it is. It's time to talk about mulligans, and today I'm not playing against a real player, I'm just playing against a computer, and I'm not even going to be playing a game. I just want to talk about mulligans, because I feel like one of the biggest mistakes that my opponents make online when I'm playing against other players is that they never take mulligans, or, you know, I'll, I'll get to a point where I see in a game the person has one land, they're on their sixth turn, and they say, you know, my luck is so bad. And I, and I just say, like, what? your luck wasn't that bad. You chose a hand with one land. So I just want to talk about what makes a good hand, when you should keep a hand, when you should ditch it. And I'm just going to go through some hands. And just, you know, this isn't preordained. I don't know what's going to happen. I just want to talk about what happens. And right off the bat, this hand here is actually pretty decent. So in general, and obviously this depends on the deck, okay? In general... A hand with three lands is a very strong start, because that basically means you are safe for the first three turns. You're not going to get mana screwed. If you have two lands, one land or two land, obviously no lands would also be bad. One land or two land, it's very easy to get mana screwed. You can get two lands and then draw spells for the rest of the game, and then you'd never be able to play most of the cards in your deck. You know, if you're playing Goblin Gangland or Peacekeepers, maybe you can survive at two lands for a little bit longer, okay? But for most of the decks, you, you're going to need at least three lands, and plus think about it this way, if you have three lands, okay, you're covered until the third turn, and by the third turn, now you've had somewhere between two and three draws, okay, so that means you also have two or three additional chances to draw a land. So maybe if the lands make up 40% of your deck, that means you're pretty much going to be guaranteed by turn four to have drawn a fourth land if not more than that. So three lands means you're pretty safe to make it to four mana. Two lands, you know, you may or may not make it to three mana. One or zero lands, you should never take those hands. So this would be a great hand. Another reason this is a great hand is because we have, starting out here, a card that allows you to draw cards. Now, not every deck has a card that allows you to draw cards, although a lot of decks do have cards that let you search your library for something and put it in your hand, whether or not it's a land, but just something to sit through your deck. So, if this hand had two lands, but then also had Sign and Blood, I might still take it because I could play two Swamps, and then on my second turn, use Sign and Blood on myself and draw two cards, and then the next turn when I drew, that means I would have drawn three cards, three more chances to draw a land. It wouldn't be get screwed. I wouldn't get screwed. The other thing I like about this hand, it's got a nice mix of cards, alright? So, we have Underworld Dreams, which I don't know if I personally like. I haven't actually trimmed this deck down, but it is it gives you something to play on turn three, and it allows you to get this into play earlier. Obviously, if you play this on turn 3 as opposed to turn 23, it's going to do a lot more damage over the course of the game, and obviously also depending on who your opponent is. I love the art on this, way better than the old Underworld Dreams art. We got Liliana Shade, which is okay. I'll probably cut this once I unlock more cards, but again, it's a creature. You can get it into play, all right? And here's the kicker, all right? Incremental Blight. Again, I don't love this card. Five, and you get to put a 1-1. One, one counter on one, then two, minus one, minus one, minus two, minus two, minus three, minus three. Not the best card, but what's great about this hand is it's a little slow, sure, but you have three guaranteed lands. You get to cause yourself to draw two cards in turn two, so you can possibly draw more good cards, okay? Or if you draw bad cards, you know, people always get sad when they use something like this and they draw bad cards, but remember, that means that now you don't have to wait two turns of drawing bad cards. Now you got those bad cards out of the way, and hopefully your next draws will be better. You got something you can drop early as an early threat, you have a creature that's also going to search out more land. And I know this is a slow hand. By the fourth turn, they could have a lot of creatures on the board. And now on the fifth turn, you have a sweeper. And you can take out three of their creatures. That's a pretty big deal. Okay? Let's say, for instance, you didn't take this hand. Let's look at another hand. Draw a new hand. All right? This hand, also not bad. All right? And this is... I would definitely always keep Sign of Blood in the deck. This is something that... You know, this is what we call a fixer in some ways, because it allows you to take a hand you would normally take. So, four swamps, okay, that's probably pushing it a little, but I wouldn't, that wouldn't make it a bad hand. I would say more than four lands or fewer than three is when you're running the risk, okay? And you want to seriously consider, do not take a hand with five lands or two lands or one land or six lands, unless, you know, the rest of your cards are so amazing, they pretty much guarantee victory, which is probably not going to happen, but you never know. All right. If this were five lands and then two cards that comboed into some, like, doing 20 damage in three turns, then yeah, maybe I would take that, but I don't know of any such thing. This is great, because you can drop these swamps, you can play Jet Medallion on second turn. Sign and Blood really doesn't have synergy with Jet Medallion, if you, you know, but you could drop the Bat on turn three, and then Sign and Blood on turn four, 
you'll have two swamps left and the jet medallion so you could if you draw something that costs three mana whatever then you still have options let's draw another hand now this would be parasing down it's called a paris mulligan at least that's what we used to call it in magic i don't know why maybe it's because they introduced this rule in paris maybe it's because uh parisian tax rates are really high um but the point is now you have six cards and when it gets to six cards it's the same kind of deal. You have to be a little less picky because you can't, you know, mulliganing down to five is really rough. It can work, but it's really rough. And people might be like, well, what does it matter? I'm just looking, I just, I'm just going to keep mulliganing until I start the game with, uh, uh, I don't know, with Sarah Ascendant. Okay, well, the problem is that you have fewer options than your opponent does. If your opponent has seven options, and now I really only have two spells here. I only have two options. So I have Innocent Blood, which would allow me to get rid of one early creature that's about it and then the shade is on turn four so this hand is very painful to take but if i was forced to to paris to mulligan down a six card i would take this hand you have one protective spell and one possible threat and then let's see let's draw down five this is actually a fucking amazing this is an amazing uh five card paris so you have two lands which sucks, but out of five cards, what else are you going to expect? All right, that's 40% of your hand, and for the most part, the decks are made up of 40% land. you got Sign and Blood to fix yourself on turn two, draw two more cards, and kind of make up for the fact that you start with five cards, okay? And then you have a threat. You've got this Warpath Ghoul, which is not great, but hey, you know, he's there. He's He can do more for you than, let's say, another land. And you got Murder, so you can murder something. Um, you know, I don't like this art. It's just too... Where's the, there's no blood. He's got mur well, he's got this. He's got like a six foot. He's got like maybe a five foot sword stabbed right through his sternum. Which, by the way, that's got to be pretty hard. But he still has the strength to hold on to his crown. So whatever this king is, whoever murdered him, I mean, geez, what a fucking sloppy. I bet they didn't even wipe the fingerprints off the sword. Anyway, murder is a cool card. This is a great hand. And honestly, going down below five is really risky. Like, what could you possibly draw that's good? See, this is rough. You know, again, this is probably as good as you're going to get out of four. You got something to play in the first turn. Then you got these two cards. But if you don't draw two swamps, you're screwed. All right? Like, just, just imagine this. Let's say I keep this hand, all right? So I have one swamp. I know I'm going to play Fume Spitter on the first turn, which is, it is a great card. Don't get me wrong. It allows for some card advantage. It allows for some interesting gameplay. Now, I draw a card. It's not a swamp. So I can play Fume, sw sw yeah, Fume Spitter. Okay, great. And this is a great card because you can chump block and then you sacrifice him and throw a counter on something. You can attack and then um, see how people block. If they block one of your other creatures, you can finish it off by putting a minus one, minus one counter on it. And as long as Fume Spitter is in play, your opponent realistically cannot play creatures with one toughness. And there we go. And this is why taking him with one land, whether it's four cards or seven cards or whatever, is really bad. Because I can't do anything this turn other than attack. Okay? Let's actually try this with another deck. And I just want to talk through this because I feel like this is one of those things you have to talk through. That people don't really understand it, okay? Unless unless you talk through it. So Liliana's more of a slow deck. Um, okay, we can go into Pack Instinct, and let's look at the hands of Pack Instinct. Okay, draw the hands. So my first seven card hand here, and here's one of the promotional unlocks. And guys. Right now, there are four sets of promotional unlocks. There may be more by the time you watch this video. that are available free cards. There's, that means there's 40 cards that you can get for free. That's one, four cards for every deck. And if you want to see what those codes are, how to unlock these, go to TopTierTactics.com. I have them listed on the website. But basically, every deck has four new cards right now. And again, by the time you check this, there might be five or six or who knows. There's 10 total new cards that are going to be released. But this is one of them. Five for five, four, Vigilance Trample. Undying. Honestly, I don't even know what Undying does. So here we go. If a creature Undying dies, what? Okay. So basically, the first time it dies, it comes back stronger. So it's a five for five four Vigilance Trample, and then if it dies, it comes back as a six five Vigilance Trample. That is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Great card. So you're going to want to get this promotion unlocks. They're totally free. I don't know if they're free forever or if it's for a limited time. But you want to go to TopTierTactics.com, enter those codes. Um, and it has not just the codes, but the instructions of how you 
uh, enter the codes, where you enter the codes, and uh, which cards they unlock, showing you which cards go for which deck. So if you want to check that out, go check it out. This is a great starting hand, all right? You got three land, which is the magic sweet spot, okay? You got a medallion to start ramping yourself up so you can play first turn, forest, go. Second turn, forest, emerald medallion. Oh, nah, I'd rather get Garak's champion on the board, all right? See, that was a, that was that would be a misplay because you could get the medallion on the board, but then what are you gonna play on your third turn? You can't get this this out third turn, so you might as well play Garrick's companion second turn. So he gets over the summoning sickness. Third turn play the medallion. Fourth turn play the Vorapede. That would be a great play. Okay, so this is a great hand. Let's look at another hand. This hand also good. All right, so you start out with the tracker. You kind of got this space though where you have three turns where nothing can happen. But if you absolutely had to and you wouldn't want to do this normally, you could early game sacrifice the, track, the tracker, make him fight some other one toughness creature on the board, cancel each other out. So you have four lands, that's not bad. This Verdant Force is one of the other promotional cards. I don't really like it for this deck. Eight for seven seven is not great. Its ability to make a one one creature every turn is not going to win it for pack instinct. You don't need chump blockers in pack instinct. You need overbearing force. Anyway, um, as far as hands go, this is still a pretty decent hand. Let's draw another one. All right. So these have all been. This is this is not a great hand, but it gives you the tools to start out. So basically, you have nature's lore which will allow you to search the library for forest card and put it directly onto the battlefield. Untapped, mind you. So you have these two cards. This this obviously ramps up your deck because you can cast spells earlier than you normally could. The same thing with Nature's Lore. But here's something that I have to say to people. If you're new to magic and you take cards like Nature's Lore out, you have to remember, this doesn't just get you a card, a land out early, which it does. So on turn three, you can have four forests in play. That's great. What it also does is it searches your deck and removes a land from it so that means that now you have like a one in 55 53 less chance of drawing a land your next draw okay so just by using this card you have a two percent less chance of drawing a land the next turn so you get to get your land on to play okay so you can cast higher spells sooner and you have less chance of drawing lands you don't need epic proportions i'm a pretty big fan of this big fan get it it's a joke okay because it's just it's a it's a creature trick, it's a combat trick that sticks around. Six flash five five. So you cast this as an instant. You get to fuck people over big time and keep fucking them over every turn with a giant goat. Some people like to be goat fuckers. Well, this time the goat is fucking you. All right, let's draw a new hand. I would keep this hand. All right, this is kind of sucks as far as five card hands goes. But if you get lucky and you get this land here, let's just see what happens. All right, we're gonna play the forest. And again, it's luck. It's luck. You have maybe a 40% chance, maybe higher than 40% because I only have one land in my hand, so maybe like 42% chance to draw another forest here. If you draw the forest, you're going to be in a good position. No. But you can Ulvenwald Tracker, however the hell you say his name. Ulvenwald. Ulvenwald. This has to be Ulvenwald Tracker. All right. That's how you say that. Pretty sure. So now, okay, I've gone one turn without an extra land. If I draw land this turn, I'll be in a good position. He's going to shock this, of course. No big surprise. By the way, Born of Flame got Lightning Bolt. And he did that at the end of my turn. He goes into his turn. I don't think Krenko's going to play anything cool. Do I draw the land? Yes. So I had two draws to get a land. And now I can play the Emerald Medallion, which is great because that means that even if I don't draw a land for my third turn, this is reduced in price. Cultivate is reduced in mana cost, which will give me... Um, the ability to go search two lands on my deck, and then I'll pretty much be fine. Obviously, if he starts dropping crazy goblins on the board, I'm fucked. But one thing you always have to remember, people say like, well, I can't take this hand because I can't have a defense up until turn three or four. Like, this guy's going to crush me. Well, how do we know Krenko has a good hand? What if Krenko has a bad hand? Obviously, this is not necessarily a bad hand. But all you're saying is you can't know if your opponent's going to have good luck or bad luck, or if they're going to take a bad mulligan either. So everyone, um, that's pretty much it. There's really not too much more to say about this. I hope this was helpful for you, especially new players who don't really understand, you know, how do you choose when you're going to take mulligans? I hope that this, um, not exactly tutorial, but this overview has given you some things to think about, some times to think about when you should keep a hand and when you should ditch it. And I hope you also stop by TopTierTactics.com and check out the promotional unlock so you can get cool new cards for free, no matter what, it's on PC, Xbox, PSN, and even iPad. The codes work for everything. There's no reason not to do it. Go check out the cards. A lot of them are really cool. I'm Wingspan TT, and I'll see you next time.